and the mouths of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I have uh, three hymns I want to sing for my uh, Flat Earth viewers out there. I know that I have quite a few. And um, I want you to seriously consider what I have to say in this study today. You need to always consider things and examine yourself and examine your beliefs in light of Scripture and in light of other things, other sources and things too, which I'll explain what I mean by that. Here we have page, well, hymn number 559, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. All right, this was written by Isaac Watts sometime late 1600s, early 1700s. He actually published it first in 1707, I think is when it was published. So, and he waited for seven years before he published his, a lot of these hymns uh, that are in here. I'll read about that here in a little bit. But this was published, so he would have had to, if he waited for seven years, it was published in 1707, it would have had to have been written at the very latest in 1700. Could have been written in the late 1600s. Okay, now one of the things I like to do, a lot of times if my wife and my son are off doing something else, I will sing hymns while I'm making breakfast or doing some other work like that. Um, I like to make breakfast. They're right now out there in the kitchen cooking. But um, I like to sing hymns. And so I was going through my hymn book, the really good hymn book that I talked about, did a review of Psalms and Hymns and Spiritual Songs. A lot of really good things in here. And they restore the original, the way that the hymn was originally written. Okay. So these aren't modern updated hymns. This, this is as close to the original way it was written as possible. And I've seen a lot of the old hymns that I was familiar with, and I see them in here, and there's whole stanzas I've never even heard of before. Um, and the wording is different, and I'm thinking, wow, these newer hymn books really have changed the way that they were originally written. But this one here is one of my favorite hymns, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. But I'm going to sing for you the... Um, see which one it is here the fourth stanza okay number four here <clears throat> it says it goes like this his dying crimson like a robe spreads o'er his body on the tree then am i dead to all the globe, and all the globe is dead to me. I'm singing down through this, and I, I read that, I sang that one, and I thought, huh? All the globe? Did I just read that right? Yeah, I read that right. Right here it is. All the globe. See if you can see it there. Hopefully you can see that. Um, now, I haven't studied the whole flat earth thing extensively, but I know one of the big claims is that all Christians have believed in the flat earth theory up until recently. That the recent thing of the globe earth is just a recent heresy and whatever else. Nobody believed it in the past. Um, then how could you have a hymn that was written over 300 years ago sing about the globe. Uh-oh. Hmm, that makes kind of a problem. Let me read the thing down here, and I'll put this up on screen. I won't be able to show this by holding it up to the camera, but it says, um, Many of the finest compositions of Watts were written in his youth for a local congregation. In his 20s, Isaac began to debate publishing his works, but remained hesitant. His brother encouraged him in a letter stating, quote, I am very confident whoever has the happiness of reading your hymns, unless he be either sot or atheist, will have a very favorable, favorable opinion of their author. There is a great need of a pen, vigorous and lively as yours, to quicken and revive the dying de devotion of the age. End quote. Still, it would be seven years later before Watts agreed to the request. A first volume in 1707 was received very well, and an enlarged edition was published two years later. The song appeared in that inaugural publication under the heading Crucifixion to the World by the Cross of Christ. These lines have been said to be one of the, the best hymns ever written, one author calling it, quote, the finest hymn in English church history. Reportedly, even Charles Wesley once said that he would have been willing to give up all 
his other hymns to have written this one. Yet for all their richness of rhyme and character, the lines are yet far too small to express the immortal depths of God's divine love. Hmm. Now, if this uh, hymn was a heretical thing here, the, the globe thing, they were all flat earthers, and Isaac Watts, for some reason, uh, it's not Isaac Newton, by the way, so don't say that in the comments. Isaac Watts, the man who wrote, you know, Amazing Grace, one of the greatest hymns ever, and he writes about the globe. Well, if it was some kind of heresy back in his day, why would Charles Wesley, another one of the great hymn writers, come out and say that this was one of the finest hymns and I could have, I would have been given up all my hymns just to write this one. And another hymn writer also praised it. Huh. You see, here's how the body of Christ works. Here's how this, this uh, happens, so to speak. Okay. How things, how can I say it? Um, when you can understand that you're on the right course, on the right track as a Christian. First and foremost, your first standard is the Word of God. I forgot my regular Bible at home, so this one here, the King James Bible. That's your first standard, most important. But secondly, there's also supposed to be fellowship of the Spirit. Fellowship of the Spirit is not some kind of a modern thing. Well, I get along with Christians today, but I just can't relate to Christians, you know, 50 years ago. Uh, that's not fellowship of the Spirit. You should be able to, if there was a time machine, you should be able to go back in any point in time in church history and get along with them on a doctrinal basis, singing praises to the Lord and things like that. When we get called up to be with the Lord and all the saints in heaven, there's not going to be, okay, if you're from the, you know, who's here from the 7th century? Okay, you go on over that way. 12th century, you're over there. You know, I'm, hi, I'm Brian. I'm from the 21st century. Oh, yeah, don't mix with the 2nd century Christians. They don't understand. No doctrinally we're going to have things that are in common so if you have a man writing about the globe in 1700 published in first in 1707 i think that there were christians around back then that were talking about the earth being a globe so don't get mad at me and say oh you're you believe in the globe earth you heretic you that's just a recent modern invention no it isn't I can share, I have fellowship of the Spirit with a man that wrote about that in 1700. I'm assuming. He might have written it earlier than that. I don't know. Hmm. Now, if you're a flat earther, you have a couple of things that you can do with this. First and foremost, you can say that Isaac Watts and others like him are lost. I'm going to be showing you two other hymns, by the way, so just hold on. Um, Isaac Watts was a lost man. He had to have been lost. There's no way he could be saved and believe in the globe earth. Uh, you know. Uh, or you could actually have some charity if you're truly saved and say, well, me personally, I agree with the flat earth thing. Somebody out there, I don't. But, you know, I, I believe in the flat earth thing and Isaac Watts, obviously, he didn't believe in it, but he's a saved man. He's a, my brother in the Lord. A brother in Christ and the Lord. Uh, great. Praise the Lord for Isaac Watts. Believed in the globe earth way back in 1700. Huh, okay, I guess I can't use the Christians always believed the flat earth thing up until recently. I guess I can't use that anymore. Brother Brian just shot that out of the water. Well, I still believe that the science proves that the earth is flat. Going with that with what people would say. Okay, fine. Um, number two, the second thing that you have to come up with if you're a flat earther or militant radical one that's unrepentant, um, hymns are not the same as scripture. Okay, I will know that I'm going to get that. There were a lot of hymns that had things in them that weren't right and whatever else, blah, 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 you know, whatever. Uh, okay, but it's still proving the fact that there were Christians in the past that believed in the globe earth. I'm not saying that because he says globe earth, that's now the same level as scripture. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is fellowship of the spirit here. I'm not a heretic. Isaac Watts was not a heretic. You're not a heretic if you believe that the earth is a globe. Okay. So flat earthers out there, I know you like to come out and cut the throats of people that don't believe the way you do. A lot of you are very satanically militant. Had one recently come out and call me Judas Iscariot, say I'm stealing from people and I'm a thief and all this other stuff. Okay. Um, very hateful, very devilish, very sensual. But um, try to grow up. Okay. It's not a salvation issue. If somebody wants to believe the earth is flat. Well, that's your problem. Whatever. Okay. Or the third option, if you're a flat earther, would be that perhaps later on that NASA might have used sort of a Mandela effect type of thing to change the hymn. You know, that could have happened. But I'm going to refute that one. 
I'm actually going to show you proof in this study that it's the exact opposite. In the past, they were talking about a globe, a ball. Hmm. And now the, the hymn has been changed. I'm going to show you the proof. To totally destroy this whole nonsensical thing of, well, flat earthers and the people in the past, all Christians believed in the flat earth. No, I just showed you proof number one. Now let's go on to proof number two. Hymn number 918. Number 918. <clears throat> and I did not do an exhaustive study either here on this. Um, there's a lot. I could have you know, gone through all the hymns in this, and I didn't. Um, there might be more that I haven't added. I'm going to issue a little challenge at the end of this. But hymn number 918, another one. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Okay, another one of the very famous hymns. Nobody would say that this was written by lost people or whatever else. And, you know, you go into it and you study their lives or something or whatever, but there's nothing offensive in this if you're truly born again. Hymn number 918. And if you keep your finger there, I'll just show you this. The other one is hymn number 922. All hail the power of Jesus' name. The same, basically the same lyrics, but it's a different tune. All right. The first one here, 918, I'll sing a little bit so you can understand the, the way it goes. It goes, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. That's how that one goes. The other one goes, All hail, 922, excuse me, 922 goes, All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Let angels prostrate fall. That is the same lyrics, basically, but it's two different versions of it. And you can see there, Edward Perrionet, John Ripon, Ripon, how do you say it? Again, 1700s, going up through there, early 1800s is when they died. And the other one here, same thing, same names here on the left. But then you have James Ellor wrote 922. And Oliver Holden wrote 918, wrote the music for it, put it to the tune there. But let's look at this thing here. We'll do hymn number 918, and I'll sing this for you. Two different stanzas here, which talk about the earth not being a flat plane. Number three, stanza number three, I guess you'd call it. Um, Crown him ye morning. No, 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 I'm thinking of the other one. Um... I'm trying to think of how to get back to the other one in my head. Um, okay. Crown him, ye morning stars of light, who fixed this floating ball. Hmm. Now hail the strength of Israel's might, and crown him Lord of all. Now hail the strength of Israel's might, and crown him Lord of all. So there you have it. Floating ball. Hmm. And then it goes down here to the next one, uh, number nine. And it says, Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball. Terrestrial. It's talking about the earth. To him all majesty ascribe, and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe, and crown him Lord of all. Two different times it talks about ball. Hmm. Up there, floating ball, number three. Down here, number nine, terrestrial ball. Now listen to what it says here in this little description thing down here at the bottom. While in India, missionary E.P. Scott sought to reach a secluded mountain tribe. Upon arrival, he was abruptly surrounded by spears. Taking his violin, he began to sing. Upon reaching the words, quote, let every kindred, every tribe, he opened his eyes to find spears replaced with tears. Hmm. Uh, maybe it's because I guess they realized that he was lying to them about the earth being, you know, flat or something or whatever. I mean, let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball. 
and the natives lower their spears and they're starting to, to weep. I mean, they had heard other ones too, but you know, the whole point I'm trying to make there is, again, why did a missionary sing that particular stanza and it moved the people to tears? If it's all just a lie, they, oh no, everybody believed the earth was, was flat up until recently. Hmm. It's kind of a, a bit of a weird situation, isn't it? Um, I'm telling you right now, uh, I've been around churches. I was born and raised in church buildings. I went to church buildings all my life, different types of church buildings. I never heard one time anybody argue about the shape of the earth. Not once. It only showed up uh, just a number of years ago, and it's become this huge, big salvation issue and very strange. But now I'm going to show you something very interesting. While we were at the store the other day, if you watched the other video, I got the uh, little... Um, this little thing here with the sick Jesus on it, the sick little blonde haired Jesus guy. <laughs> yeah, I got that and my son saw this, the book of hymns, you know, the symbol, if you've been around Christianity for a while, that's Methodist. And um, he said, oh, I'd like to have that hymn book. Could we get that hymn book? And he was looking through it and he loves a lot of the old hymns. So I said, yeah, I said, yeah, I don't think I have a Methodist hymn book with all their added stuff in the back here, you know, all their Nicene Creed and all this other stuff. And so I thought, yeah, okay. I said, yeah, we'll get that too. I gave a few dollars into the donation box thing. And I got to thinking about this this morning, and I thought, I wonder what this one has in it for those hymns there. All hail the power of Jesus' name, and when I survey the wondrous cross. Both hymns appear in here. And this is published, by the way, in, um, to you the uh, copyright date here. Copyright 1964. Hopefully you can make that out. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so first we'll start out with When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And um, in the hymn book here, this one, the really good one, there are five different stanzas. This one, there's only four. Do you know which one they took out? They took out the one about the uh, the ball. Or no, I'm sorry, the globe. The globe. I was thinking of the other one. They took out the globe. Why would they take out the one about the globe? I mean, you know, what was it, 1962? They had the supposed moon landing thing. Um, hmm. So you would think that it's right there in the minds of these people and it would be very popular to keep it in as, you know, something about the globe, but yet they took it out. Weird. Hmm. But what about all hail the power of Jesus name? They actually have three different tombs here, tunes here to it. They have, um, this one here by Oliver Holden on page 71. You can kind of see it there. And uh, then they have the one by um, James Elor and then another by um, William Shrub, Shrubsoul right there. Okay. So this is the one by James Elor. Um, <clears throat> so... We'll go back to the one by uh, uh, Oliver Holden. But uh, here you have, remember it was two different places in the 918 here with the good hymn book. Two different places that they mentioned first. They mentioned this floating ball and then this terrestrial ball. Okay, so number three, the third stanza, and number nine, the ninth stanza in the good hymn book. This one here... Um, all they have is they took out a whole bunch of them, but then the fourth one, let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball. So right there they have it. See it on this terrestrial ball right there. Okay. So, hmm. Um, they were kind of a little bit picky and choosy there, but I mean, again, 1964, uh, they took out... When I survey the wondrous cross, they took out the reference to the globe completely. 
Here they took out one of the references to on this floating ball. When people were just crazy, going crazy about the space race and everything else, NASA was in its heyday and everything else. Why wouldn't you leave that stuff in if the flat earth teaching was there and you're trying to get people swayed over to becoming globe earth, round earth people or spherical earth people, whatever. Seems kind of odd. Remove it completely from one hymn and take out one of the references from another one. Leave in one reference. But it doesn't stop there. You can go online and just type in All Hail the Power of Jesus Name lyrics or lyrics to All Hail the Power of Jesus Name. And I'll put this web page up here. I have it printed out here. But um, hymnary.org. Modern hymn thing here. And it says uh, representative text down here. Over here on the third one, let every tongue and every tribe responsive to his call. What? They took out on this terrestrial ball. And you can see down there, Psalter Hymnal, Gray, 1987. Hmm. Now, please explain that to me. I mean, forget all your emotions, forget all the stuff that you think that you know and whatever else, what side that you're on and you need to fight and answer... Why are they changing this? This one here that represents the one that was written back late 1700s, early 1800s, is saying floating ball, terrestrial ball. 1964 comes along, they take it away the floating ball and it's just terrestrial ball. 1987 comes along and they take away terrestrial ball and now it's just um, responsive to his call. Huh? Let every kindred, or let every tongue, let every tribe, and every tribe responsive to his call. Why can't you say on this terrestrial ball? You see, this is the exact opposite of the way it should be. If you believe in the flat earth conspiracy that there was, everybody was flat earth and then they became, you know, globe earth later. You should be seeing uh, an increase in, in uh, globe earth type of stuff and pro globe earth propaganda, but it's a, the exact opposite. Isn't that kind of strange? Hmm. I mean, I guess you might, maybe you believe that uh, things are actually getting better and that more people are coming to the flat earth truth or something, and that's why they're taking it out of the hymnal, hymnals. I don't believe that way. So, <clears throat> thought that was a little strange. So, what can we learn? The shape of the earth doesn't determine salvation. I'll say that one more time. The shape of the earth doesn't determine salvation. It doesn't. There's a lot of problems with the flat earth teaching. I do not believe it and I will never believe it. All right. I think it's a lot of nonsense, quite frankly. And if you're going to get mad and you're going to come out and stab me in the back and whatever throughout the whole ministry, because I don't believe the shape of the earth is what you believe, well then go away. It's very simple. Globe earth belief is not a new teaching. That's another one of the things, one of the lies that I've heard. Oh, everybody believed in the flat earth. I remember there was one of these guys and um, and he came out and he was showing some older woman and he said, what did they teach you in school? And she said, they taught us the earth was flat. And he said about, yeah, he said, this globe earth stuff's new. And she, and she said, oh yes, it is. It's new. And it, that was a lie. That's a lie. They believed it back in the 1700s, writing hymns about it. <clears throat> and the truth of the matter is, I know a lot of hymns that I can sing by heart. Um, I've made it a purpose over the years to try and learn as many old hymns as I can from these old hymn books. This one here is kind of the one that's just the, the best of the best that I've ever found. It really tries to restore a lot of the original you know, hymns back to the way that they were written. And I know a lot of these hymns. Um, and I've never found one hymn that ever supported anything about a flat earth. And that's my challenge. To you out there if you believe in the flat earth system and you're thinking that that's the way it should be and whatever okay then please show me one hymn from this hymn book don't send me the new ones the modern ones i don't trust the modern ones one hymn from this old hymn book right here this one that restores the original way that the hymns were written show me one hymn that says anything about a flat plane, flat earth, whatever kind of a thing, 
show me one, right? I just showed you two, and basically three, it's slightly reworded and, and the, the tune's different, but two different hymns written in the 1700s, late 1600s up through maybe 1700s, maybe early 1800s. I don't know the exact date of when the uh, second one was written there. But I showed you two different hymns that both talk about the earth being a floating ball, a globe, a terrestrial ball. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so there you go. That's my challenge to you out there, to all the people that are so militantly flat earth. Um, please put a, a hymn down in the comment section from that hymn book. Show me an old hymn that mentions the flat earth. All right. And if you can't do that, you can't show it to me from the King James Bible. You can't show me that Christians historically were singing about a flat earth. I can show you uh, from the King James Bible, at least that the earth is round there. It's not a flat square or whatever else. But I can show you why I believe the earth is a globe in here. And I can show you that Christians would have agreed with me in the past. And you know what? As I've said before, I don't care what you believe. And if you're going to get militant and whatever else and be attacking me and things, you'll answer to God for it. You will answer to God for that. Tearing down this ministry because of the shape of the earth. Shame on you. That is going to be it. And hopefully I'll see you in the next video. If you have enough grace to continue watching me, uh, you don't have to agree with me in everything, you know. All right. So, bye-bye. <laughs> Get busy on your homework there. Go find me a flat earth hymn where they talk about the hymns or the, the flat earth and the hymn. All right. See you around. Thank you for watching.